college football is so stupid because I, as a casual fan who has friends who love one of these teams, it's so hard to care about this game and give a crap about it because it doesn't mean anything. Because now if you don't make it to the college football playoff, your holy season is stupid. Anyway, that's all. Tell us how you really feel. All right, that's going to do it for the two-minute drill today. First off for us, coming out of that, I feel like I need to give Andrew some time to plug in his microphone because as a Coug fan, because yeah. yes. I'm, as you saw from our picture, I am a Cougar alumni. I, I went to Washington State. But while I was there, every program was terrible. Yeah. So I was just... Weren't we good at basketball? When we were there? No. That was right before I got there. I was there the year before you were there. Yes. That was a good team. You got to watch Clay Thompson. (laughs) Yeah. And the year before and they were coming off really good team that made the tournament run. Me, on the other hand, got there and we were terrible at everything. So everybody's like, oh, why are you still root for Oregon State when you went to Wazoo? And I'm like, (laughs) they gave me zero reason to go to a game. (laughs) <laughs> the only games I went to were rugby games because I was playing in them. Isn't the women's and I soccer will... program usually pretty good? Yeah. Hey, we're, we're going to the Final Four. <laughs> yeah. Women's soccer. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the real takeaway from Saturday. Yeah. Just so you know. Yeah. That's the only... We're going to ignore, ignore the Apple yeah. Cup, which was Friday, by the way. Oh, thanks. But let's get into this <laughs> real quick here, Andrew. Because he said Mike Leach is a good coach. I agree with him. I've talked to some Coug fans who really, really don't like Mike Leach for a plethora of regions, I love him. reasons. One of them being that he throws his players under the bus. So, real quickly, Andrew, what do you think about oh, how he talks about his <laughs> players and who he puts the responsibility on after games? And is he actually a good enough coach where he can beat Chris Peterson, or does he just hit his ceiling every year before that game? Oh, geez. I know, I'm laying easy it on questions. It. Yeah, easy questions. I, I don't mind the way that he talks about those players because he doesn't change. Like, he doesn't... He, I. It does not seem to me, at least, that he ever pretends not to be a guy that's going to be like, hey, you didn't play very good. <laughs> and, and for me, like, I can handle that guy if he's that way all the time. Uh... It does bother me. I don't want to hear my coach making excuses about his his recruiting class. Like, yeah, WSU is never going to have a better recruiting, or probably never going to have a better recruiting class than UW. It it doesn't like we're we're playing the game because we want to play the game. We we're, it's, we're not just going to decide on recruiting classes. So I thought that was a dumb comment. But as far as whether he'll ever win, I don't know. I feel like he's the epitome of the coach that does what he does. And, like, this is what I do. That's what we're going to do. No matter what. And no matter what. And I, I like him as the coach of WSU. But I think that he has a ceiling because of not just where he's coaching, but the way he coaches. I don't think, for example, I don't think that you could put him on at Alabama I don't think that he would. I don't think that he would perform amazingly with Alabama. Like he, his like he, his system wouldn't wouldn't maximize both sides of the ball, in my opinion. Um, you'd end up with a team that could exactly like Washington State score fifty points one week and turn the ball over fifty times the next <laughs> week. You know, so I. I don't know if he'll ever beat Washington because but those I think are the kind of teams that could beat a really good team. Exactly, they could, <laughs> could. However, the familiarity is going to make it re- like I, in my opinion, it's going to take either a really good Wazoo team like we had last year, um, and unfortunately, didn't get like. It was so frustrating to watch them play in the snow. Oh no, no they, the weather didn't like affect them. The commentator said so. Before. They look like they've never seen snow before. It's not an excuse. <laughs> it's a further damnation. Yeah. A Cougar football team should play good in snow. Because uh, you might have to, because yeah, you're playing outdoors in eastern Washington. Yes. But it, it would it would take a good it will take a good WSU team against a down uh, husky team or 
it's going to take the Husky defensive coordinator literally just being high the entire game. Right, but that was part of my point. Was the, not the high, not the part about him being high. But, like, take last year's WSU team, play against this year's Husky team. I think that we would have won. I think, I think yeah. Gardner you could even would take would have been dominant. Would anybody have been surprised under normal circumstances last year if that Cougar team had beaten that Husky team? I mean, maybe a little bit. But those were two really good teams, and I think we all went into that thinking, okay, the Cougs have a real shot here, and they got affected by the weather, and it's, like you said, it's not an excuse because both teams had to play in it, but their style of offense obviously didn't translate well in that type of weather. So, yeah. so and they to couldn't me, adjust. you know, looking at what Mike Leach did last year, looking at what WSU did last year, to think that, you know, over the next four years or so, if Mike Leach lasts there that long, over the next four years or so, could it line up where the Cougs have a team like they had last year and the Huskies have a team more like what they had this year? And, I mean, it seems realistic to me that they, they could pull one out. Yeah. It's definitely... What's the defensive coordinator? Is it Jimmy Lake? Is that his... Yeah. If he gets a head coach job somewhere else, then I w- my expectations will raise for the next Apple Cup. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. I, I mean, he's defense, had that number. UW's defense has been absolutely suffocating to our offense, ever ever since we've been playing, uh, uh, Leach has been playing them. We we beat them one his first year. That was it, and that was before Chris Peterson. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Peterson hasn't lost, so it's it's a tough one. But I, I do agree with you, Justin. The possibility is there, so I don't think it's like we said. Will they ever? They could, but some things are going to have to fall into place. I'm going to expect them to win every single one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> well, and you guys are you guys are diehard Cougs, and I love that about you. And you know, whatever your guys' teams Daniel's, are, Daniel's rolling. Really okay, Daniel's a, a die little easy bit of a die easy Coug. Coug. Okay, Andrew, you're a diehard Coug. But basically, I I tend to root with you guys on these kind of things. Like this season has been so disappointing that. Yesterday, I was working during the Apple Cup. I didn't even care. I couldn't even motivate myself to check the score randomly, look at it on my lunch break. I, after the game was over, I went in there and basically looked at what Jacob Eason's stat line was. And that was the only thing I cared about in that game. Because I'm still on the, in that mode where I'm like, how are people talking about him? Like, he's going to be a top 10 draft pick where I'm watching every time I turn a Husky game on, he's throwing it to the other team. That's kind of my thoughts on it. But that's the only thing I cared about. So, like, to me, this college football system is so frustrating because, like, you know, you guys are going to root for the Cougars, and you guys are going to care about that game. We posted pictures to Twitter and Facebook <laughs> to prove it. Yeah. But for someone like me who's, like, I kind of tend to root for whichever team has a chance to make some serious noise, it stinks now. And I'm, I'm agreeing I'm the worst kind of fan, but I want to see one of these yeah. two teams <laughs> go get a shot to go play in the football playoff. So they created this playoff where it minimizes every other bowl game and it minimizes the accomplishment of every team except for the four who make it in there. And they made it too small. Way they too needed small. to either have no playoff so that bowl games could t- still be celebrated or they need to expand this sucker to like 16 teams. Yeah. Because even eight is still going to be too small. It would be a step in the right direction. You could get one school from each power conference and then a couple of wild cards or something like that. But it frustrates me to no end to see like, you know, the argument is always, well, the great thing about college football is all these games are playoff games, and it's Until so... Until you've had one loss. It's so stupid, because that's it. You lose a game, and then your season is shot, and yeah. then nothing matters anymore. You're just so, gone. yeah, and then, and like... Then, and then you hear coaches talking about, like, well, I mean, the Rose Bowl's great. Yeah, but, it, but we, really... We would love to be... And then they lose another game. Well, uh, the Pac-12 yeah. championship would be cool. Man, you know what? We're yeah. bowl eligible. We're bowl eligible. Maybe we can make it to the only Penn Real Estate Bowl, <laughs> basically. <laughs> But you know, but that's that's kind of the point. Is like, you can't you can't convince me that this Husky team wasn't yeah. affected by that. Like they lose a couple of tough games, and like all of a sudden you went into this, you were highly ranked, you were highly expected to go make some serious noise, and all of a sudden you're six and five or whatever garbage. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. Right now I can't tell if if that was a good thing that you like a good plug for our sponsor. <laughs> it was <laughs> that was the for our Be, No, it wasn't because. This is a the, boy. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a very small local business. So I if he no, was sponsoring get, a bowl game, 
That would be a big deal. I meant it to be a positive plug, and Daniel's spinning it. Spin I'm it. not spinning it. I want you to clarify it so we don't get in trouble. I think the Oli Penn Real Estate Bowl should be the national championship. There you go. I like that. There you go. Well, we could have it in, guys have have in Olympic Stadium. Do you guys have more thoughts about the broken college football system? I like yelling, yelling, but I think I'm all yelled out. I agree 100%. And I was going to touch on that... Uh, Computerized strike zone thing, but you basically said everything I was thinking. So yeah, I don't you know, have anything to I add. I mean, you know, great minds. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we'll we'll go with that. Yeah, Andrew's here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's jump into the Seahawks game that's coming up on Monday Night Football. The Seahawks are going to the yeah no they have Minnesota at hosting home. yeah so I mean why are you even talking about this we're gonna win it's a Monday Night Football game at home. All right, let's go. Good the <laughs> The ESPN Power <laughs> Index slightly favors Minnesota. They're like a, they had like a fifty three percent win probability. Also, I don't know where it came from. <laughs> we lost two games at home. We yeah. have Monday night. We're there. I'm hundred percent with you. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing is the primetime thing. For some reason, the Seahawks are just ridiculous when it comes to primetime football. But also, so for me, I kind of want to get into. What are some of your thoughts about what these team, what the Seahawks need to do on defense and what they need to do on offense? And I'll start it off by the, the most important thing for me is I think that they need to stop the run on defense. Dalvin Cook is having a heck of a year so far. They've gone to him a ton. He's got 214 carries for 1,017 yards, 11 touchdowns. He's averaging almost five yards a carry. And I think that's got to be the first priority for this Minnesota, for the Seahawks team, is to shut down Minnesota's run game. And I know they got weapons on the outside, but that's just, I think it starts when you take that away. And I think the Seahawks team has done an amazing job at taking the run game away from teams. I mean, look at San Francisco and what they were doing. But the Seahawks, just their natural way they play defense, seems to be more focused on stopping the run than other teams. Yeah, this is, and forgive me if I'm mixing up my teams and quarterbacks here, this is Kirk Cousins in primetime, right? Yeah. So can't we that just, was my next point. Can't we just <laughs> stack eight guys in the box and let Kirk Cousins shoot himself in the foot? I feel like we have, this is, this is so big, I don't have the stats in front of me, you but know it's funny? this is a big enough sample size of Kirk Cousins in primetime repeatedly pooping his pants <laughs> that I feel like if, it, if that streak were broken against the Seahawks, I would be devastated. So yeah, yeah, I would say absolutely 100% stopping the run is is the uh, big factor. Yeah. So since but you're you flashing stats in my since face, you though. mentioned Kirk Cousins, yeah. I'll just jump into my next key then, which is making Kirk Cousins look like how he should look. Yeah. Because you mentioned what he tends to do on prime time. That's kind of all of our just six, like, six wins, thirteen losses in yeah, prime time. We're just kind of like, eh, it's Kirk Cousins. He's, come on. But it's not going to worry about Kirk extremely Cousins. poopy performances on statistically. Yeah, yeah. but here's what. That's let me record. Let me know if this changes what you're thinking about this game coming up this season. He's got 21 touchdowns and only three interceptions. He's got a completion percentage of 70.6%. You know who those numbers sound remarkably like? Russell Wilson. So does hearing what he's doing this year think that maybe he won't be as bad on primetime as what we know and love from Kirk Cousins, which is what I think he will be when the defense starts to get after him. But do those make you worried at all? I would say... Russell Wilson, by the way, 24 touchdowns, three interceptions, so he's got three more touchdowns. He also has more yards, and uh, but his completion percentage is 67%. I would, I would add to that that uh, Kirk Cousins wasn't amazing at the beginning of the year and seemed to be progressively getting better as the season went on. And he actually went through a stretch where people looked up and it was like, oh my gosh, Kirk Cousins has the highest QBR in the last month. That was a few weeks ago. But, I mean, I guess we shouldn't be shocked if he falls somewhere in between. Like, I think that the sample size of him on primetime is large enough that there's something there. And even times when he was playing well, he came out and was terrible on primetime. 
So I feel like the sample size is big enough that he legitimately has some kind of a yips or mental issue <laughs> on primetime. Like there's, there's there's enough games to show that he's a different quarterback than he normally is. But since he's a better quarterback now than he's ever been before, could we expect to see average Kirk Cousins? <laughs> and if we see average Kirk Cousins, not poopy pants Kirk Cousins, <laughs> then would a big game from Dalvin Cook be what they need to push him over the over the edge? Um, I think that's realistic. Yeah, yeah. But I still think, to to your point from before, I feel like stopping the run is the bigger key because you know I'm trying to flash back through Kirk Cousins' career, but I don't think he's ever played with a running back for extended time who's been having a year like this. And you know how the run opens the pass and the pass opens the run. So I feel like they're helping each other out right now, and the fact that Dalvin Cook has been so good in the run game has definitely made things easier for Cousins. And it's definitely interesting to see, because of that, how they have leaned more on the run at some points this year, being the Minnesota Vikings. But also, a lot of teams then feel like they have to change what they're doing on defense to stop the run. But going back to my point, I think that's just kind of how the Seahawks come into every game is we're going to shut down the run. And so it seems like it plays into their system. And what they like to do is that they don't have to change to shut down a team's running game. That's what they like to do. They like to stay in base defense. They have three linebackers who are really good. Most teams rarely use three linebackers ever. So it seems like it's a scramble. Oh no, we got to stop the run. We got to put eight guys in the box. We got to do all this. And the Seahawks, it's like, no, this is what we do. We stop the run. And then we go from there. And I think the, the next part of that is so many teams sell out so much to stop the run and their linebackers are it kind of put so much more in a frenzy of having to go after the run that then they leave the middle of the field open. And I think that's where guys like Kyle Rudolph and I think they have another tight end that's having a decent year. But I think that's where they become effective is because those linebackers are then forced, they're taking that one false step. To, to cover the run instead of keeping their assignments against tight ends. Yeah, and I think there's there's another factor in the passing game, too, which is that Adam Thielen is out. Is um, he going to be out? Yes, he is he's going to be out. He is, it was announced today that he is not playing. Yeah, Do we, I didn't start him in my fantasy I team. I did start him in my <laughs> fantasy team and didn't have time to switch him out. So well, I thank got you for your sacrifice. A goose egg there. Uh, but do we know if Clowney's playing? Well, you could pick up another one of their receivers, right? I Like... Scooter McGavin or whoever's coming off the bike. Shooter McGavin is a golfer from <laughs> Happy Gilmore. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I probably could, but I'm so focused on this show that, you know, I'm not... Yeah, uh, sure, that's about that. Uh, so. Seahawks expect Jadavian Clowney and Jaron Reed to play. Okay, so that's a Good. big deal. That's a because big deal. Because we've been talking about the defensive line and the defensive line rotation and remembering that the best Seahawks teams that we've had have really good defensive line rotations. So we went into this season... When, or when, when we knew that we were getting Jadavian Clowney, we looked at it and we were like, oh my gosh, our front seven could be so good. And I feel like for the most part, once Clowney was kind of acclimated to the system and, and got found his way and we we're mostly healthy, the, the front seven has been really good. So I feel like this is a legitimate enough defensive line and linebacker group that it's going to cause enough problems for Dalvin Cook anyway. I feel relatively comfortable with Seattle staying in their base defense and then just adjusting if necessary. Um, We don't always see them adjust when necessary. They're not the best at making in-game adjustments like that, but but it feels to me like the personnel that's going to be on the field should be enough to be able to slow down the run game. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I agree. And it was nice to see without Clowney, it was nice to see that defensive line still play well. It was nice to see Ziggy Ansah, as we mentioned. We hadn't seen him. He was a ghost before this. It was kind of, oh, there goes Ziggy. Did he do anything? No. Okay. <laughs> but, but he has a cool name. Yeah, but now it's, it's good to see him back out there. And he had a sack and another half a sack in that game. So hopefully with this coming into a rotation, with some of those young guys starting to be mixed in, and you see those players rotate in and out, so it's not just Clowney, it's not just Reed, it's not just Ansa, but you see, you know, Rasheem Green, and they rotate in and they stay fresh, and so they are. That's one of the weirdest things that, to me, in, in professional football, by the way, is how 
every, it's seemingly every position group except for defensive backs, and basically defensive backs rotate, and offensive linemen. So you get fresh receivers in here running at DBs who are just running wind sprints, and you get the same biggest guys on the field who you think would get the most tired mm -hmm. doing their job going against fresh defensive linemen all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you can have a rotation where you can keep them fresh and stay effective, I think that can be a huge plus for the Seahawks. I think the only, uh, yeah, the downside as far as the offensive line rotation thing is offensive line is so based on chemistry and how well you work off of each other. So that's probably why you don't see more rotation. But yes. to your point, absolutely a good defensive line rotation should be able to take advantage of that. Because just fresh bodies on the field going up against tired bodies. And offensive linemen, like people, I don't know how people think generally about like how tired an offensive lineman should do, but if you've ever played football, even like or basketball, or any any sport where you, there's a difference between grinding and pushing against somebody and running, it's exhausting to grind and push against somebody. And yeah, you're not going out like a receiver is and sprinting 30 yards down the field on a regular basis. You get tired in a different way. And it would be exhausting. So yeah, I would think you know being able to rotate defensive linemen definitely makes a big difference in that way. So, random question I want to throw to you guys. Okay, I'm excited. So, we have... A very small sample size on this, but Andrew, I want you in on this too. I'm listening. I'm he's here. texting. He's like, I'm here. I'm here. He's I'm texting. Do producer things. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a very small sample size from one of these things and a pretty good sample size for the other. Who is more important to the defensive success for the Seattle Seahawks? Is it Quandre Diggs or is it Jadeveon Clowney? Now we saw the Seahawks with Clowney and without Diggs for much, most of the season. We saw the Seahawks with Diggs and without Clowney for one time this season. It seemed like the Seahawks had most of their success when Diggs was on the field, even when Clowney wasn't. Was that just because we were playing the Eagles who aren't very good? Or is that <laughs> saying something Miami. that is that saying something <laughs> that he fixes the coverage that much, gives that much more confidence to the linebackers, to the corners, to everybody? that he makes the bigger difference than Clowney, who is obviously, I'm not trying to downgrade Clowney at all, but he can be more effective when he's got help on the back end. For me, it's not, a, I don't think it's it's close. And that is, again, not saying that Clowney hasn't been a monster all season, but that's the thing, he has been a monster all season. He's been taking double teams all season, but he can't get home because they're getting rid of the ball because Diggs is not there in the middle. We've got Trey Flowers and, and no, not Trey Flowers, uh, T2, Tedrick, yeah. Tedrick and, and Blair with him. Like, I love Blair. Blair is not ready to play a solid defensive back. And and Diggs, as you, you and I both had the experience of playing DB, and when you know that all you have to do is your job, that's all you have to do. Yeah, and it's it so, it so much, much easier. easier. Yeah. So much easier. So I think Diggs, Diggs is, in my opinion, clearly more important. more important because he's allowing Clowney to get home. And we've seen Clowney. I don't think Clowney all of a sudden started being a monster against the 49ers. I think all of a sudden he had literally a quarter to a half second longer. I'll take both. <laughs> Dude, what do you, think? you know, I got, it's really hard, but I mean, you saw the difference when Diggs got in. It, it, the sack numbers jumped when he started playing. And I, again, as Andrew mentioned, Clowney is destroying offensive linemen, absolutely destroying them. But it, he's right. It seemed like the ball was out, like instantly, instantly, instantly. We weren't getting any of those numbers going after the quarterback. So I think I want to see some more. First of all, I want to see more with both of them out there. I don't really want to make my definitive statement on this, like this is absolutely <laughs> it, but I'm leaning that way because that's the one difference the last two games where we've gone. I mean, the Ravens, we played pretty good defense against the Ravens. We did. The, the offense gave up two touchdowns in that game. A lot of people like to forget that when they're talking about how good Lamar Jackson was. He didn't do much in that game. It was mostly their defense. But I think... 
the Diggs factor is going to be a big one, and hopefully we don't have to see another game without him back there. All right, let's switch over to the offensive side of the ball a little bit. Justin, what is your number one goal? What's the number one thing you want to see from the Seahawks that you think will help them win on Monday night? From Pass the protection? Pass protection, yeah, I would say. Because uh, <laughs> yes. we'll have to share that chart that you made, Andrew, from our Facebook page. We'll do that at oh, some point. Yeah. That's Andrew a made one. a really good chart that shows uh, basically – Pass rush, win, pass block win rate. Is that what it yeah, is? So these are two advanced me- metrics. One of them is pass block win rate, and the other one is QBR. So basically, it was to measure um, quarterbacks' success efficiency. as opposed efficiency as opposed to how well their team pass blocks for them. And Russell Wilson is a total outlier, where he is up on the top end of QBR when when our pass block Fourth win overall. rate fourth overall, and our pass block win rate was in the bottom five. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in the bottom five in protecting him, but he still is in the top four in quarterback efficiency. I mean, to me, and I know there's he been... He was number one for a long time. He was number one for the last time, couple weeks. But there's a few guys that have that have passed him. Yeah. It's not that he's played poorly. He hasn't been quite as out of his mind as he was earlier in the year. Um, but I, I feel like the offense is clicking in so many ways right now that just a little bit of extra pass blocking would absolutely set them over the top. I mean, we have really good receivers. Tyler Lockett's played really well. DK Metcalf, I think, has been even a little bit better than what... Well, you guys loved him. I was skeptical going in. He's been better than I thought he was going to be. Um, we've gotten good, good, uh, good production from the tight ends. Like, no matter what tight end we throw out there, they seem to be able to make plays, even though they keep constantly getting injured. I feel like... Penny, Carson, skill position guys, like everything is set for this offense to score 40 points a game and the pla- the pass blocking just is <laughs> a little bit better. That's that's what I feel. If they could get that that quarter second on our pass block <laughs> then, yeah. and then we're yeah. taking away from the other side. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. I absolutely agree with you. Pass blocking would be a number one. Kind of an underlying thing that I'm curious about and I think is really important for them to figure out is with the continued fumbling issues of Chris Carson, even though we all love how he runs, and the beginning, or what could be the beginning, of Rashad Penny breaking out, how do you mix those two to get them enough carries and enough rhythm that it can be successful? And I say that as important to figure out because you can't just go one than the other, one than the other, because you don't get into a rhythm as a running back that way. So how do you mix those two so that both have the chance to be successful on any given night? Yeah, I feel like probably you give somebody a shot and ride the hot hand, right? So, you know, you figure out who your starter is. You you put them in. You let them be the main guy. Give them a breather with the other guy. But and what that, if it's Carson and he fumbles? Then you move away from Carson. <laughs> so Carson's going to get away with some of that stuff because he runs like a man and he can scoot, which means he's fast. Yes. So... He, they're really <laughs> similar players, except that Carson has proved a little bit more with his production, and um, Penny seems to not have as much of a fumbling problem. So, <laughs> you know, you go into it, figure out who your guy is. I imagine at this point it's probably still Carson. And I think if Carson goes and he's playing well, you let him, you let him roll. If he's kind of playing so-so and he fumbles the ball, you switch to Penny. That's probably the way I feel like it should be handled. Um, you know, I'm not an NFL coach, and they might have better ideas about how to do it. But I feel like with running backs, you want them to get momentum, and you only want to take them out if it's a third down play or if you want them to have a chance to get a break. So you, you probably start with Carson, see how he does, and then if you need to change the pace, then you switch it up. I My only question with that, I, I agree with you, but if you pull Carson after his next fumble, when do you go back to him? Like, are do you do you go ahead and give him the start the next the next game? I'm asking you. Well, like, I just I don't know. I feel like we've been at this point with Carson a couple times this year already, yeah. and it tends to go in waves. Yeah. At least this season, maybe it's not a large enough sample size to say that that's the way it's always going to be. But Carson had a really bad stretch early in the year, and everybody's going, "Oh, get him out of there! We don't want him anymore." 
And then he had a stretch of games where he was really solid and his ball protection was really good. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a problem that's going to go away. So it's just all about weighing, out, you know, weighing out how you feel about it. And I don't have a really strong opinion about whether or not he should be gone because I'm wishy washy. <laughs> I'm a flippy flopper. So I watch him and I think that dude can scoot. He makes fast people look not fast. And uh -huh. then again, the next week, I'm like. He can hang on to the ball. Get him out of the game. So and that's actually the interesting thing is I think Penny's faster than him. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, and then th that's the thing about your, it. There's another home run shot. Like, yeah. I feel like they're, they're not the same back, even though they do similar. They're similar. similar. They're similar. They're built similarly. I don't think either one should be like a third down back or this guy can only run for two yards. I think they both have big playability. I think Penny's is slightly bigger. Like I figure, like he can he can run for a fifty-eight yard touchdown. I'm not sure if Carson doesn't get tracked down there. So I, I don't know. I'm not an offensive line guy. So when I say this, this is something I've heard people say that sounded reasonable. But I have heard it said that Penny is not a zone runner, and he's. he's I'm not sure if either of them are. Well. When the people that I've heard saying, I've heard, I've, on the internet, I've seen a couple people talking about this, and it sounded reasonable, it, that Carson was much better at zone, at running into the zone blocking scheme, and that Penny's big plays were on plays where they were, they were more traditional power plays and not zone blocking. Um, that could make it more difficult to switch between them a lot, too. I, I, but, like I said, I'm not an offensive line person. They're, yeah. they're big people, and I try to stay away. <laughs> I, I guess I, if I were to pick a guy right now, like, I know we talked about this a little bit last week with coaches too, a lot of things is it's about trust. So yeah. if you've given Carson buttloads of chances to prove something to you and he continually gives the ball away, which is like Pete Carroll's number one bugaboo, um, I feel like it, I might lean a little bit towards going to Penny because that's a guy I can trust. But as someone who's, as a fan who's watched Carson like put up these highlight runs, that's the only guy that's making me flash back to Marshawn Lynch sometimes. It's hard for me to not want that guy on the field. Yeah. I want to see both of them, and I want to see I want to see what both of them can both of them can do. Can I have that? Can I just have it you all? Want, can I have my cake and eat it? Why are food? we putting any? Yeah. Why, why aren't we putting both of them and and Lockett and uh, Metcalf Metcalf in? And Hollister, why? Why we don't have a good third wide receiver? Why are we trying to pretend we do? We uh, did also we watch well, Penny with Hunter oh Gordon. Block. We have oh, Gordon yeah. Badly yeah, that was last game. oh yeah. Oh, you're right. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was bizarre. Uh, was I didn't hear that explained though. Did you hear it explained? No, I did not. Uh, so according to Carol, what happened was the uh, end there was not blitzing, and Penny Penny picked him up and saw that he was not blitzing and looked back towards the play and the guy took off. Whoop, went so, right behind him. So it wasn't, it, uh, and Carol was saying, it's not an excuse, but hopefully it was a quick learning lesson. Yeah, don't just like, turn around. Can't take your eyes off the guy you're supposed to block. <laughs> oh, so it wasn't an explanation like, oh, he didn't do anything wrong. It was an explanation no. like, oh, he made a yeah. bad play. What happened was, was better. yeah. Because yeah. I felt like that was left, actually, his eyes left the guy. I felt like that was kind of obvious. Of the like, as soon as he looked away, the guy took off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, back to, touching on something Andrew said, you don't have a good third wide receiver. This is something that I am wanting to see more of is we, we have Lockett. We, we've liked what we've seen from Metcalf. I think there's we, we all see the growth and see that he has the ability he's, to make those plays. He's also the second best uh, rookie receiver in the league right now. Is right? he really? Yeah. yeah. So I think that we... But, and yet you can see that there's oh, more yeah. there. You can oh, see yeah. that there's more there. But how much of an impact does Josh Gordon start to make on this team? And You're right. I if, forgot about it. If you can get to <laughs> a three-headed monster that is truly a healthy Tyler Lockett, a healthy and ready and in the season form of Josh Gordon and a DK Metcalf, I mean, that should be a three-headed monster on the outside that we have never even come close to seeing before in yeah. Seattle with wide receivers. I thought we would see more of Josh Gordon quicker than we have. Um, I mean, it seems like, like I, I yeah, I know, I know. And in the first one, it was like, you know, he could only they they flat out said he can only be out there if he knows the play and he's yeah. still learning the playbook. 
maybe it's an unreasonable expectation for me to feel like his knowledge of the playbook should be greatly expanded in a week. Maybe he's that's not his strength. I mean, some other guys might be better at it. But it seems like all he can run is slants. And he's, he's really, really good, at, good, it, good at, it. at it. But when they need a slant, they put him in the games. But but he's so much cap- he's capable of so much more. Is than this that. the yeah. first time that we've ever had a receiver that was good at running slants that we should actually be throwing slants to? <laughs> uh, there's one other receiver, and it was a tight end who I vividly <laughs> remember being awesome at slants, and that was Zach Miller. Yes, that yes. guy was a stud at slants. So it's good that we have a slant guy, I guess. But also. <laughs> I'm going to keep banging on the John or Sua drum here. Do we need so who is this? Do we need David Moore <laughs> out there when when he does the same things as Metcalf and Gordon just not as good? Yeah. Like I don't need that guy. Now they have him returning punts and kicks. Like, yeah. So you okay. want Ursua because he'll be more, I'm gonna, he'll be better in the slot. Again, yes. Nobody's ever going to even know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I I'm do. I'm gonna keep mentioning because you told me. Yeah. And, and he's a Hawaii guy. Come on, uh, we should know about. I'm this a guy. die easy Hawaii fan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll get off the John Ursua soapbox. John, just so you know, you do have one fan out there still. Who, Two if you become really good. Yeah. Three, I was going to say. You've got potential fans. <laughs> Any, anything else about this game in particular that you want to talk about before we move on? No. Okay, so let's move on to the playoff picture a little bit. Right now, uh, even though San Francisco lost, they're still tied at the top of the NFC with the New Orleans Saints at 10-2. and two, But that loss gives the Seahawks some breathing room because we still play them in that last game of the regular season. So even if the Seahawks drop a game here either this week or next week, they're kind of still in the same position where you have the tiebreaker and you're only one game back, and that's really all that matters. Because if you end the regular season tied with them but you beat them two times, then that means you were the division champion. So really the Seahawks have a little bit of breathing room now even though right now they're a half game back since they haven't played against Minnesota. But if they win that game tomorrow night, they're 10-2, and they own the tiebreaker, they're the top of the division, that's huge coming into this playoff hunt down the stretch because winning the division will be super important. Exactly. Well, and because winning the the division quite possibly could mean there's a bye on the line is the big thing. Whoever wins this division has a pretty good shot at getting one of those two bye weeks in the playoffs. And... Let's just say, I don't want to jinx it or anything, but let's just say, assuming the Seahawks beat the Vikings and they're even, the 49ers and Seahawks are even in record, they both have pretty difficult schedules down the stretch. The Seahawks are still at the Rams, at the Panthers, and they have the 49ers in that last week. The one in the middle there where you think, okay, that should be a win, that's the Cardinals. You can't overlook any game in the NFL, but it feels like... It feels like that should be a win. Gosh, they've screwed up. It's true. It's true. It's true. And the 49ers are kind of in a similar spot because they're at the Saints next week. And uh, they finish with the Rams and then at Seattle, but they have a a Falcons game in there. So there's one game for each team where you think, okay, that's probably a gimme, but the other three are all, this should be pretty competitive games. So it'll be interesting to see how this finishes, but that 49ers loss to the Ravens is really significant because it takes this, like, it really felt like when the 49ers were undefeated, this was going to be their division. I mean, there were people that were already local people that were already talking about us as a wild uh, Seahawks as a wild. Yeah, guy. absolutely. So now to know that we've got a shot to not only be tied for the division lead, but technically have the advantage because you own the tiebreaker at this point is a really big deal. It's a really big deal for Baltimore too, because holy cow, man, these, this team has beat the Seahawks, the Patriots, the 49ers. Like, they're going through, they're, they've they lost team games they shouldn't have lost, but they are, they're giant killers right now. Yeah, I'm not sure about the Patriots, role. though. <laughs> oh, yeah, Andrew's watching the Patriots game right now, and uh, they're, well, they're going to lose. Points. They're going to lose. Whew. Yeah, it's taking a beating right now. Yeah, nine which points. Is, they have nine points now. Which is always <laughs> good to see. Always good to see the Patriots. Oh, but that defense was so historically great. Greatest defense of all time when they were playing a bunch of garbage teams. <laughs> like the first four games in the season. I, I am not the only I'm not the only one who was mad about that, right? No. Because no, every no. every national analyst was going, Well, you know, their strength of schedule hasn't been great, but look at what they're doing. Yeah. And I'm going, Can we wait until they play somebody? I mean yeah. their defense is good. I'm not trying to say that it's not, but they're 
you know, yeah. in my mind, like, of the great defenses of all time, of which I think, you know, our best Seattle Seahawks defense is one of it. Oh, yeah. One of them. It yes. drove me nuts that this Patriots team was being discussed in that same yeah. in that same conversation. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, and it's the whole it's the whole Patriots schedule thing that makes me shake my head because you get two games against the Jets, two games against the <laughs> Dolphins, and two games against the Bills every year. Thank goodness the Bills seem like they have a breath of life in them this year, but I'm not expecting much out of them either, even though they're nine and three. But I mean, it's like yeah, it's just playing against the <laughs> Like, half, almost half your season is ago. Oh. <laughs> All right. We need to make our predictions for this game, too. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. Did we decide on what we We haven't decided do? on what the punishment's going to be. Mm-hmm. So we're going to decide on the fly. Here's what I would say. And the only problem is I don't know how to punish Andrew if he loses. I could really easily get my hands on some Elma Eagles gear. Oh. So I, if I were to lose, I could very easily have probably a shirt and a hat for Elma and wear it during next week's show. Doesn't your son have Husky gear? Yes. Could we give that to Andrew? Yeah. Okay. So if we all agree I to this punishment, there will be a game. I think. <laughs> I think the thing that hurts Daniel the most is wearing some kind of Bobcat gear. Oh. Um, yeah, Bobcats or Ducks. We've done Ducks, Duck, though. I want to do ducks. something new. We and I've, I've done Duke. Yeah. You have done Duke. But if I wear Elma gear on a video, I'm going to hear about it. Yeah, you are. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Is there a way for me to get Aberdeen? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Joe lives across the street. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got I can hook you up with also, Aberdeen also. gear, too, if you need it. Yeah, there's a, okay. <laughs> okay, so the, we're talking about I don't like for this. next week's show for the recording. And we won't do extra punishment like we did when you had to do the Kaepernicking selfie and we did the whole making of the Kaepernick Wait, selfie video. A, yeah. When I basically went over way overboard from the punishment you were saying. <laughs> made it way worse. Yeah. We won't do that. We'll just say <laughs> oh you have to wear the gear while we record the show. Okay. And it'll be on the that's, video. That's good enough for just a simple... I mean, this isn't yeah. like our March Madness bracket, which where I'm sure we'll have... Some much bigger yes. punishments going on for this, but this is just a simple Monday night football game. Calm down. Yeah. So, here, <laughs> so here's my my proposal for how we okay. score it. All right, I think we take total points over under. Like we'll pick a score. Each oh, of us geez. will pick a score. Okay. Whoever gets the total points over under, um, however far away off from the actual one you are, you get points for that. Okay. And then whatever the scoring disparity is, how close you are to that. And for every one you're off, you get a point for that. So and whoever about, has the highest loses. Are you doing this because you're assuming we're all going to pick the Seahawks? Yes, we're all going to pick the Seahawks. Are we all picking the Seahawks? I was going to ask if there's a punishment for someone being right because they didn't pick the Seahawks. <laughs> like, that should be a punishment, too. We're all picking the Seahawks. Okay, we're okay. all picking the okay. Seahawks. Good, apparently, because yeah. we all believe that Kirk Cousins is going to be trash on yeah. Monday Night Football. Yeah. No, I just but I want to pick. It's going to be awesome. I want to predict last MVP, well, so hey. I can see what you guys do. Hey, and then face time. <laughs> I don't I like think this. that I don't think that we should be able to say it. I think we should write oh, it down, down and write it down. down. Okay. Okay. This so, is going to make really good radio. Yeah. So we are writing stuff down, and Courtney's going to sing a song. No, okay. No, she's shaking her head. She's no, we good. can talk while we write. We're smart <laughs> enough to do that. Are we though? Well, okay, okay, so tomorrow. we're picking. I think it, I'm going to pick Seattle. Okay. I think it's going to be... Yeah, I wrote my score down. No, I can't go away from what I wrote down. Did you guys write yours down? I'm close. Mine's weird. Uh, it's a weird score. Uh, I think you're going to like it. I'm going to go... Oh, you're going weird? So yeah. I, I just I'm need a, a winner and a score. You need I'm... a winner and a score. Yep. Okay. Are we all ready? Okay, yeah. Andrew, what's yours? Uh, I'm picking Seattle, 34-17. 34-17. Ooh, I'm going Seattle, 31-17. Okay, so my... <laughs> you don't believe in our kicker. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, I went really different from you guys. I went 19-12. to 12. What? I'm expecting a very different kind of game than you are. I'm sorry, have you seen Russell Wilson play this year? I have. Um, Russell's going to throw three touchdowns, and they're going to only make one of the extra points. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and they're gonna are they gonna miss their extra points on two touchdowns? No, they're gonna have four field goals. Four field goals. 
All right, so those are locked in, Justin. Either said. that or two field goals and three safeties. It's one of those things. And we also <laughs> haven't recorded what your rules are for this, too. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's no finagling your way out of it. Well, you know, you can make audio sound like anything now. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I see you're a Richard Sherman fan. Uh, oh, I am a fan of Richard Sherman. I wish he would have said stuff about Russell that he says about Garoppolo now because it's obviously super similar situation. Anyway, I digress. <laughs>